great to see uh, see other people get involved, as Micah mentioned, and uh, it's great to see Micah up here. Great recap, getting us to where we are as an uncommon people. A lot of what he talked about sounds a lot like a kingdom of priests. And so, what I'm going to share with you this morning is right off the bat, it's probably not going to be some big revelation to you. It's probably not going to surprise you when I say to you that that the world in which we live, the community in which we live, the county even, the country in which we live, seems like it's becoming increasingly angry, increasingly bitter. There's so much conflict and division. You can just turn on the news and you can watch and there's, there's somebody berating somebody else or somebody accusing somebody else or some, some new scandal it seems or you can open up any social media app and, and you'll see this conflict again and again and again and like it's almost oppressive just how negative it seems like things are anymore. And so as I was thinking about that, I, I wondered, man, are there any statistics that sort of back up this feeling that we have. And I, I found one really recent study, and I want to share some of those statistics with you. And it says that negative social media posts outnumber positive social media posts by a ratio of more than two to one. You believe that? At least two to one. And not only do they outnumber positive social media posts two to one, but it seems like if you want something to go viral, make it negative. If you want something to spread, then start, you know, bashing on somebody else. And it's kind of like those fights that used to break out in, in my high school cafeteria. And like the circle would start and like, yeah, get them, get them, get them. And that's what it feels like so much today when you turn on the news or when you watch social media. And then I thought, I wonder if there's any studies out there on love and forgiveness, the opposite of this. And so I found a study, it's, it's not a recent study, it's a little bit older, it's by this, this organization called the Fetzer Institute, it's, it's a secular organization, but they, they did a survey of Americans and they shared the results and it all had to do with love and forgiveness. And the first statistic that they shared was this number 90, 90% of those surveyed said that they believe there should be more love and more forgiveness in their country and in the world. I'm part of that 90%, how about you? Be great, wouldn't it? 90%. So yes, I would love to see more love and more forgiveness. But then 58% of those surveyed said that they believe that there are offenses, there are things that people could do that are unforgivable. So while 90% want to see more love and forgiveness, more than half say there are some things that somebody could do to me and they are unforgivable. You know, and I think about my house, what is unforgivable? Here's one unforgivable sin in my household, leaving the empty K-cup in the Keurig unforgivable another unforgivable sin I can think of is on 340 driving less than 55 miles an hour the the speed limit is 55 which everybody knows means 62 okay (laughs) another unforgivable sin false starts in in really important fourth downs my wife reminded me of this yesterday. I was watching Virginia Tech. The poor, my poor Hokies got beat again, and it was a critical fourth down, and some offensive lineman uh, flinches and then gets a five-yard penalty, and I'm yelling at the screen, and she said, Aaron, you're preaching on unforgiveness tomorrow, and here you are yelling at some poor guy trying to do the best he can. But seriously, what is that for you? What is that unforgivable sin? What is that thing that you would say, man, if somebody did that to me, that's it. I'm done. If somebody said that to me, they're cut off. Forget about it. That is unforgivable. And then 74% of those surveyed said that they believe that people in this country would take advantage of another person if they had the opportunity. (sighs) Almost three quarters of the people surveyed said they don't trust their neighbors. They don't trust their brothers or their sisters. And then 50%. And this number are people that claim to be people of spirituality, religion that doesn't say that they're Christian. It just says it's people that that identified as religious and spiritual. So their faith obviously is important to them. 50% of those surveyed said that, that forgiveness for them is conditional. The other person would have to do something in order for them to forgive. And so it it paints this picture. There's these two worldviews. There's this one worldview, this kingdom of self, that, that says, hey, if somebody hurts me, if somebody offends me, this cancel culture, then, then they're cut off. I'm not going to have any more to do with them. There are things that they could do, and I'm never going to forgive them. 
And that dominates the day. And then there's this other worldview, this, this worldview of, of the narrative of God who says, I am all about restoration. I'm looking for people to partner with me as I seek to redeem and restore. I want everybody to be a part of my story. And I'm gonna show unconditional love. And I want you to be a kingdom of priests. And, and this narrative, God said, he created creation. Mankind was very good, the opposite of this distrust that we see. And so we had these two worldviews that just collide with one another. And it's a time in which being unforgiving is all too common. But what I want to challenge us with this morning, church, as God's people, as part of his kingdom, as a kingdom of priests and followers of Jesus, he calls us to display uncommon forgiveness. And that is the title of my sermon today. And and I'm just going to say up front that this is a tough teaching. That no doubt, and I don't, it doesn't, go past me and believe me I've spent a lot of time praying about this there are people sitting in this very auditorium or watching online that have had incredible hurt and incredible pain and they've had unimaginable things done to him done to them and they've been victims of things and and there's no doubt there's a ton of hurt even right now and animosity and I'm not by any measure trying to trivialize that and say forgiveness is easy it is really hard Matter of fact, apart from the power of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit and surrendering to him, it's impossible, I would almost say. And so as we go through this today, this is not my words. This, we're gonna look at the words of Jesus and what he had to say about forgiveness because Jesus had a lot to say about forgiveness. It was the cornerstone of the gospel and the cornerstone of his preaching because you can't have the gospel if you don't have forgiveness and he calls us to follow him and showing uncommon forgiveness so before we jump in let's pray together dear heavenly father lord we come to you this morning as people who in our own very sinful selfish nature we don't want to forgive god we want to pass judgment and we want to punish it's that's the way it's been since sin entered this world so many years ago but God, we know that we follow a Savior. We follow a King that, that, that gives the example of what forgiveness looks like and He calls us to do the same and He equips us as we surrender to Him and we allow Him to work in our hearts and the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts that He, he tells us you can show the world what forgiveness looks like. And so this morning, God, we just ask that your Holy Spirit right now would start breaking up hard ground in our hearts that it would allow us to wrestle with this idea of forgiveness in a way that glorifies you, that we might be a people on mission to show this angry world around us what love looks like. As in your name we ask it, amen. And so the, the scripture that we're gonna look at this morning is a, is a parable taught by Jesus in Matthew 18, and it's the parable of the unforgiving servant. And I'm going to tee this up just a little bit before we jump into it. And what we're going to do today is we're going to cover some surface level learnings that we get from this story. And then Jesus is actually saying a whole lot more. And so we're going to dive a little bit deeper into what Jesus is saying. And then I'm going to leave you with some practical things to walk out of here with of how do I begin or how do I get to this journey that brings me to uncommon forgiveness. And so just before this parable that Jesus tells, Jesus had just got done talking to his disciples about what you do if your brother sins against you. And he says, you go to your brother and if you still don't win him over, then you take somebody else and you go to your brother. And if that doesn't work, you take him before the church. And if that doesn't work, then you treat him as a tax collector or a pagan or a Gentile. Now, a lot of us may hear that and say, okay, well, if that doesn't work and we don't win them over, then we just cut them off. That's not what Jesus is saying. What did Jesus do with tax collectors and Gentiles? He loved them. He spent time with them. What Jesus is saying is keep the circle small when you're dealing with when your brother sins against you. And so on the heels of that, we have Peter. Gosh, man, we love Peter, right? Peter steps into this parable. And we're going to read this together, and then we'll go back and start fleshing out uh, some of the teachings. And so in verse 21 of Matthew 18, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Now, some scholars think that Peter may actually be talking about his brother Andrew that was a disciple with him. Like, man, Jesus, this little brother is like really annoying. Like, I'm with him all the time. And like, how often do I have to keep forgiving this guy? 
Jesus said to him, I, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Your translation may, set, may say 70 times seven. I've got this in yellow because it's important. Commit that to memory. We're going to come back to it. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, out of compassion for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused and he went out and had him put in prison until he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers, your translation may say tormentors, until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Man, I just imagine Jesus as he's teaching his disciples, kind of maybe even pointing his finger to his disciples. This is what will happen to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And so first of all, I want to look at some main characters in this parable that Jesus tells because they obviously represent someone. First, we have this king. That's Jesus. Then we have this servant. That servant is me. That servant is you. We are the servant in this story. And then we have this other servant that ends up getting choked. This is the brother or sister, this fellow servant. And then we have the other servants that we see mentioned in here, and that is the community of servants. And so going back over the story, the, the king is, is going basically, the, the terms used here is like an audit. He is going through his ledger books and he's saying, let's look at the ledger sheet. Let's look at what everybody owes the king. Let's see who is left with a balance and let's see who's paid in full. And they find this servant that owes 10,000 talents and the king says, bring him to me. Now, 10,000 talents doesn't mean a lot to us, right? But here's what it meant to that servant. 10,000 talents, a day's wage in those times was one denarius. And the way it worked is you would work a day for somebody and they paid you at the end of that day. There was no direct deposit into the first bank of Jerusalem every two weeks. You worked a day, you got your denarius. One talent equals 6,000 denarii or 6,000 days wages or 20 years. So 10,000 talents, the debt that this servant owed was 60 million denarii or 200,000 years of labor. In other words, it was a debt that this servant could never repay. It was impossible. Picking up what Jesus is putting down, we have this king and we have this servant that owes him a debt that he couldn't pay. And you think to yourself, what king would do that? I mean, aren't kings supposed to be wise? Shouldn't, shouldn't kings have great administrative powers because aren't they entrusted to usher the resources of the kingdom that they are leading towards productive ends for the good of the community? What king would let somebody amass a debt like this that they could never repay? Can I pose to you this morning? It was a type of king that wanted to show incredible, unbelievable grace and mercy and uncommon forgiveness. That's the kind of king that lets somebody amass a debt like that. And that's who Jesus is for us. And so then this servant says, I, I can't pay. And so the king says, well, I'm going to sell you and I'm going to sell your wife and I'm going to sell your children. Now, the fact that those details are included lets us know something about what kind of servant this was. It was a bond servant. And the Jews listening to this 
disciples listening to this would have gone in their minds right back to Exodus. Seems like we keep going back to Exodus. Exodus 21, verses three through six. And they give, the, they give instructions on how you treat a bond servant. And every seven years, you were supposed to set that bond servant free. And if that bond servant brought his wife with him, then the bond servant and his wife got to go free. But if the king provided a wife to that bond servant, then the, that wife remained as property and the children remained as property of that king. Now, at the end of those six years, when it comes to the seventh year, the bondservant could choose to voluntarily serve this king for the rest of his life. And they actually give a way in which the servant can do that. All the servant has to do is say this, I love my king, I love my wife, I love my children, I wanna serve this king for the rest of my life. And they would take the bondservant out to the city gate where business is done, they would put him up against a post and they would pierce his ear with an awl as a sign that this servant has said he is going to voluntarily serve this king for the rest of his life. And in this story, that's obviously what happened. And it's obvious that this king had provided a family for this bond servant because he was going to be able to sell them. And so we have a servant who has said, I love this king. I'm volunteering to serve this king for the rest of my life. And then he pleads and he says, just give me time. Well, we know that's not, that's impossible. This is a debt that they could never repay. There's no way time was gonna do it. And so the king has pity on the servant. And the word pity used here is, is actually compassion and, it, and it's it, like it indicates in the bowels, like in the deepest parts of this king, he had this unbelievable compassion on the servant. And he not only forgives him of his debt, but he sets him free. And then the servant, man, can you imagine that feeling? Man, this debt is paid off. And so I can imagine the servant, you know, kind of like skipping down the road, like, oh, what a beautiful morning. Like, he was happy. And then he remembered, man, my buddy Joe owes me 100 denarii, which was four months wages. Joe, short for Joseph. That was a good biblical name for the time. That's why I used it. So he goes and finds Joe, and he starts to choke him. Pay me what you owe. And Joe says, just give me more time. And the servant says, nope, not for you, Joe. And he has him thrown in the debtor's prison. And then the other servants, the community of servants, they see this injustice and they can't stand it. And I don't know if they know the story. I don't know if they would have know what had happened to the servant, but they says, this isn't right. And they go to the king and they tell him what had happened. And the king goes and he, he grabs the servant and he brings him back and he says, you wicked servant. I just showed you all this grace and compassion and mercy, this uncommon forgiveness. And you couldn't even do the same for your brother. So I'm gonna throw you into jail to be tormented. And so... That's where we leave the story. But when Jesus, you've got to remember that Jesus is a rabbi, and so Jesus is always teaching. And his Jewish disciples had started memorizing the law since they were five years old. They knew their Bible. They knew their text. And so almost always when Jesus is talking, as he is referencing something, either in the Torah or, or the Tanakh, they called it, what we would call the Old Testament. And so Jesus was clearly saying something. I want to go back, and numbers are important when you see them in the Bible. I want to look at what Jesus is saying because he's teaching us even a deeper truth than what we just went through. And so then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And so you need to understand in that day, there was this kind of unspoken rule that if your brother offends you, the Pharisaical law at that point, if your brother offends you, you only have to restore them three times and then you can just go ahead and cut them off and you can be done with them. And so here's Peter probably thinking, all right, I, I think I know what kind of Messiah I serve. I, I can hear, I hear him talking about forgiveness and love. So, you know, Peter's got some guts about him. They called it chutzpah back then, right? He's got some intestinal fortitude. And so Peter comes forward and is like, y'all watch this. Jesus, seven times I should forgive him? Look what I did, y'all. And Jesus says, no, Peter, I don't say to you seven times, but 77 times. What is Jesus talking about? There is only one other time in Scripture that this term 77 or 70 times 7 is used, and everybody listening would have known what he was talking about. And we find that at the end of Genesis 4 with this dude named Lamech. So I want to go back there because that's where Jesus would have been taking everybody. Who is Lamech? Lamech is a descendant of a person you all know very well, and that guy's name is Cain. And would you know that he is 
not just any generational descendant of Cain. He is the seventh generational descendant of Cain. Now, the number seven in the Bible is, a, is the number for completion. Seven days of, six days of creation and the Sabbath, that's seven, seven's completion. And so seven generations after Cain, we had this guy Lamech. And so in the end of chapter four of Genesis, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's revenge is 77-fold. And here's what we see. Here's this guy Lamech. And we got somebody that had wounded him. We don't know what that is. We don't know if it's physical or psychological or emotional. And we've got a young man that struck him. And Lamech has this desire to respond with punishment that far outweighs and far exceeds the offense done to him. And what Jesus is saying in this reference to 77 times is he says, just as Lamech had this desire to overpunish, to pass judgment that far exceeded the crime that was committed, as your people, as, as my people, as followers of Jesus, as a kingdom of priests, we should have that same desire to forgive far and above the offense that's been done to us. We need to be a people who outforgive offense and outforgive sin. That's what Jesus is saying to his followers as they sit there and listen to us to him speak and then you think well wow that's pretty powerful if you think about what people have done to me how do you out forgive that and it's not easy I would say to you that the only way we do that is supernatural through the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit as we surrender to Christ and we follow his example but Jesus is actually saying something even deeper with this reference to this story in Genesis 4. He's not just saying that we have to out-forgive offenses against us. He's pointing all those listening to, to the core, the very root of where our unforgiveness comes from. And he's going all the way back to that descendant, the father, the ancestor of this guy Lamech. He's going all the way back to Cain. And he says, that's where your unforgiveness starts. And so as we look at that story in Genesis 4 at the beginning, now Adam and Eve, I know most of you know this story, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived him and bore, she conceived and bore a Cain saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, he was a shepherd, and Cain a worker of the ground, he was a farmer. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? Pay attention to this next statement that the Lord makes. But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and then when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel, and he killed him. Cain's name literally means acquirer. He was Cain the acquirer. And what did Cain acquire? Well, he was a farmer. Cain acquired land. And in those days, if you were a landowner, you were wealthy. Not only did he acquire land, he farmed the land, and he grew what seemed to be a tremendous amount of crops. And so Cain's identity was in the crops and the land that he, that he, that he farmed and the crops that he produced. That's who Cain was. That's where his identity was. And so Cain was actually the first person that we see in Scripture to offer an offering to the Lord, but the Lord had no regard for it. Why is that? Because Cain felt like he was the one doing the work, and so he offers this offering to the Lord, almost as a token, this saying, God, I know I need you, God, like I need rain, and I need the right temperatures, and like I need no locusts, and, and, and you know, no insects to help me farm the soil and to produce good crops, and so it wasn't a, out of a heart of abundance of God, I, I realize that you are the provider of all good things, that you have blessed me tremendously, and then out a heart of gratitude I offer you this offering but it was more of a I just want to keep you happy God because I know I need you to help me with this farming thing because man I really am proud of this land that I have and these crops that I'm producing and so he just offered some of what he had whereas Abel Abel said I 
I understand that everything comes from you and you have blessed me tremendously and I'm gonna give you the best of what I have out of heart of gratitude for who you are. And so Cain was angry that God didn't accept his offering and his face had fallen. I can only imagine for those of you um, who have kids or been around kids, remember when they don't get their way and they get like that, that pouty lip, right? My brother-in-law, Jim, Jim Grandstaff, uh, has this song that he used to sing to his kids and then he used to sing it to my kids called the Poochie Lip Song. And if, anybody of you, if any of you ever heard that song, he might have made it up. I don't know. Did he make it up, Carrie? I don't know. But it, it goes something like this. The poochie lip will get you when you start to pout. Poochie lip will get you if you don't watch out. So watch that lower lip when it starts to drip. The poochie lip will get you if you don't watch out. And that's what Cain was doing at this point. He was angry and his face had fallen. And God says, Cain, you've got a chance here. Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you, not be an ex- will you not be accepted? You have the opportunity to do the right thing. You're in a really tricky situation. You're at right off at a tipping point, Cain. This is an important decision that you're about to make. There is, there is this passion inside of you. There is this voice inside of you telling you to do something. But listen to my voice. You have a choice to make. And if you do the right thing, you'll be accepted. But if you don't, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is against you. And we see what happens. Cain goes out, has words with his brother, and it kills him. And as a result, we all know the story, God passes judgment on Cain after he asks him where his brother is, and he says that now as a result of what you've done, there's gonna be um, retribution, and, and here's what God does. He divorces Cain from the thing that was his identity. He separates him from the land, and he says you're gonna be a wanderer for the rest of your life. And we see Cain's response to that. And he says to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. And then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain lest anyone who found him should attack him. Then you fast forward seven generations. We have Lamech that we looked at who said, if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then mine shall be 77-fold. In other words, Lamech was saying, God said anybody that harms Cain is gonna be, have vengeance against them seven times. Well, I'm gonna do what I wanna do, and, I, and if you offend me, then I'm gonna kill you. And if anybody tries to take care of me because of that, then their vengeance should be 77-fold. I'm gonna one-up God. Actually, I'm gonna seven-up God. That's what Lamech is saying. And so Jesus says, this is the core of our unforgiveness. Church, this is where it starts. And I'm gonna go back to this verse that Jesus says, if you do what, or God, that the Lord says to Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, then sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. When somebody offends us, when somebody threatens our identity, when somebody harms us, when somebody tries to punish us or or they engage in character assassination against us. Jesus is saying when that happens, it's just like it did with Cain. You have a choice to make. And if you don't make the right choice, be careful because sin is crouching at your door and it can turn deadly. And if you think I'm stretching, then remember in Matthew 5 on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you've heard it said that you should not murder. I'm telling you, do not have anger in your heart against your brother because that's where murder starts. Now, we don't know how Cain killed Abel. Many think, based on commentary, that, that he hit him in the head with a rock. But it's interesting that I found some commentary that said maybe even before that, the first thing he did was he put a hand, his hands around Cain's neck and began to choke him. And maybe that's why Jesus, in his parable, said the servant began to choke his fellow servant. He's saying, being careful, this unforgiveness can go really wrong. And sin has a desire that is against you. It's against who I created you to be. I created you to be people in my own image, to have my character, a character of restoration, a character of reconciliation, a character of unbelievable, uncommon love, a character of unbelievable, uncommon forgiveness. That's who I created you to be. And sin wants the opposite of that. 
I created you, as Pastor Mike told us last week, to have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, to be peacemakers, to have things put back in order, to restore, not to tear us apart. That's who I created you to be. So be careful because this sin thing is about to drive you into the ditch. And it ended in the murder, the very first murder recorded in Scripture. And so Jesus is saying, hey, be careful when you don't forgive because there's a fate that awaits you. What is that fate? Let's go back to our parable. The king says to the servant after he brought him back, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers or the tormentors until he should pay all his debt. You may have a translation that says till he should pay all that was due unto him. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This phrase here until he should pay all his debt until he should pay if you look at that word it doesn't mean just to pay back there is another meaning of this word and it means to guess what church it means to restore so well that's weird that means you're going to throw this this servant in prison i mean did your character change like what happened to this gracious king what happened to this merciful king of unbelievable uncommon forgiveness why did his character change and now he's punishing somebody and he's not showing them forgiveness well because he's not really punishing them he's saying you're going to be thrown into a prison until you can restore restore who not the king we already said he can't pay that back this till he should restore all that was due unto him the him and here is his fellow servant what jesus is saying is if you can't forgive then i'm throwing you into a prison until you can learn how to restore your fellow servant and forgive your fellow servant wow and jesus says that's what awaits every single one of you who can't learn to forgive how many andy griffith fans do we have in here some of you how many don't even know who andy griffith is as a phrase. that's how you know you're getting old when there's people in the audience that don't know who Andy Griffith is I loved watching Andy Griffith when I was young I remember in the summertime they always played it and you know I loved watching it and and so if you don't know who Andy Griffith is he was the sheriff of this small town called Mayberry he didn't even carry a gun his weapon was relationships he had great relationships with everybody and he influenced people to do the right thing but there was this town drunk named Otis there's Otis Otis would go out on a bender and he would get schnockered and then he would come to the courtroom and he would open the door and he would go and let himself into the jail and he would lock the jail door behind him. And whenever Otis sobered up, he would literally reach through the bars and the keys to the jail were hanging on a hook right outside the jail. And he would reach through and he would grab the keys and he would unlock the door and he would let himself out. And so what Jesus is saying is, you're being an Otis. If you can't forgive, I'm going to throw you to a jail. You're going to be tormented in a jail of your own making. And you have the key to let yourself out. And that key is forgiveness. That's what awaits anybody who can't learn to forgive. We're in a jail of our own making, this jail of torment. What are we tormented by? Anger. Scorn. Bitterness restlessness hatred judgment arrogance seclusion self-pity addiction maybe depression maybe and the list goes on and on and on this is what happens to us when we can't forgive we put ourselves in this jail we have the key and the key is uncommon forgiveness you see jesus came to perfectly fulfill the law and perfectly fulfill the scriptures and perfectly display what perfect forgiveness looks like because he took on a debt that he did not owe and he even said from the cross forgive them for they know not what they do and and time and time and time again jesus says you have to forgive it's all about relationships it's all about love if you're going to be my people if you're going to be a kingdom of priests this has to be a character trait uncommon forgiveness because in a world that is darkened by anger in a world that is darkened by wrath in this cancel culture in which we live the only way they are going to see jesus the only way there can be restoration is if his people display uncommon forgiveness what we're called to do and yeah i'm sure there are excuses of why we don't forgive we all got them right i'm going to ask you right now as you 
think about this and as you hear this message I'm sure some of those excuses have probably started to creep into your mind I'm going to ask you to fire your inner lawyer no offense Caleb fire your inner lawyer and just be open to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you one excuse you hear a lot is you don't know what they've done to me you're right I don't I don't know what people have done to you and there are no doubt people sitting in here that have had things done to them that nobody else even knows about that they have struggled with maybe even for decades deep hurt you don't know what they've done to me but what you're saying when you forgive is there's no way you can pay the debt back to me there is no way you can fix the hurt there's no way you can repair the damage but in spite of that i'm going to choose restoration in spite of that i'm going to release you from the judgment that i have i'm going to release you from the debt that you owe me and i'm going to choose reconciliation and that's not easy but that's what jesus calls us to do i can forgive but i can't forget i think sometimes when we forgive especially when when we were innocent and we may be even the victim i think sometimes when when we we can't forgive it, it we it's because we feel like we're saying it's okay what the other person did to us if i forgive that's weakness was jesus weak if I forgive, then I'm, I'm saying that what they did was, I, I'm, I'm going ahead and I'm, I'm verifying that what they did was okay. That is not, it's actually the opposite. You're saying, it's not okay. And I might not ever forgive what you did to me. But in spite of that, I'm going to choose restoration. Because isn't it more powerful to know what somebody did to you and still be able to forgive them than it is just to forget it happened altogether? Man, that's uncommon forgiveness. Or you may say, I forgive them. If I forgive them, they would just do it again. Yeah, they probably will because that's what people do. That's what people do. They, they sin. They're going to hurt you again. But Jesus says very clearly here, the 70 times 7 means we have to out-forgive offense. We have to out-forgive sin against us. It's imperative for us to be able to out-forgive sin. It is essential to us as a kingdom of priests to be able to out-forgive sin. Because if we don't, who will? Our choice to forgive or our choice not to forgive as people of God has kingdom implications, church. It has kingdom implications because we, as a kingdom of priests, as followers of Jesus, when we are unforgiving... That says that our kingdom is, not different than, is no different than the rest of the kingdoms of this world. It has kingdom implications. And so if you're sitting here this morning, you're like, well, practically, how, how do I start to forgive? Let me give you a couple things to do. First of all, write down the person's name and what they've done. And then ask yourself a couple questions. Do they know they hurt me? There are some people that, that don't speak to to others and that other person has no idea why they have no idea what they've done do they know they hurt me have they asked for forgiveness have they asked to be forgiven and i've just withheld it because man i, I want to have the power when really i'm just putting myself in a jail of my own making then go and tell them how you feel if they don't know that they've hurt you go tell them and then pray for that person every day and ask the holy spirit to supernaturally give you the ability and the capacity to forgive to start the process of reconciliation to start the process of restoration and you might be like ah oh, i can't do that aaron it's hard it's incredibly hard it's painful but jesus says it's the only way we can be as a kingdom of priests and i'm going to give you the grace the mercy to do it because i have forgiven you much much more than anybody has ever done to you and I would say, be honest with yourself. Are there people, you might be sitting here saying, well, hey, I really don't have any unforgiveness. I I'm, I'm, feel like I'm kind of good with everybody, but let's be honest with ourselves for a second. Are there people that you just would say, I don't care for them? Man, I don't care for that person. Why? What's at the root of that? Are there people you just don't talk to anymore? Like, man, I, I canceled them. I can't even remember why I don't talk to them. I just know I'm not supposed to talk to them anymore. 
What's at the root of that? Are there behaviors or addictions that could be rooted in unforgiveness? Studies show that that many addictions, a lot of depression, psychological disorders, eating disorders are rooted in deep, deep, deep hurts and that person had never learned to forgive. If that's you here this morning, man, can I challenge you to start dealing with that, to start to see what restoration looks like. Before we go on, I would say to you that It's important that if somebody comes to you when people hurt you, don't choke them and throw them in a prison. Okay? Don't go grab them like the servant did his buddy Joe and it's like, hey, I'm going to pass judgment on you. I'm going to throw you into prison. Remember that you hold the key to your own prison. You can be the Otis, but you can let yourself out. And then keep the big picture of the gospel front and center. When people hurt you and you you feel that, that voice inside of you, that, that voice that the Lord was war- warning Cain about, like, man, I'm going to get them back. I'm going to lash back out. When you feel that start to happen, go back to the gospel. What is the gospel all about? It's all about restoration. It's all about reconciliation. It's Jesus coming and saying there's a new kingdom and that kingdom is here and it's different than every other kingdom. It's uncommon. There's no such thing as cancel culture. It's all about inclusion. And, and to do that, we have to be a people that forgive because unforgiveness is the opposite of the gospel unforgiveness is the opposite of the gospel and then spend time with Jesus spend time getting to know him spend time in his word spend time learning about the heart of God and who Jesus is and who he calls us to be know your bible Because one of the key learnings from this parable that Jesus tells is that this servant had spent time with this unbelievably gracious, unbelievably merciful, unbelievably forgiving king. And there's no doubt one of the reasons he decided he to serve him for the rest of his life because he had seen that king do those very things to other people in his kingdom. And this servant spent time with that king and then he left that king with an unchanged heart. Let's not be those people. Spend time with Jesus and say, I'm not gonna leave with an unchanged heart. I'm gonna ask the Holy Spirit and the words of God to change my heart, to get me to the point of reconciliation and forgiveness. And then I would say, don't pick up the other end of the rope. There would be people that will come to you and they will say, you, you won't believe what so-and-so did to me. And they're looking for an ally. They're, they're looking for somebody to, to help them gang up on this other person. You know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing. Don't pick up the other end of the rope. Don't join in the mob mentality or the character assassination, but instead gently take them back to the loving words of Jesus and what the gospel is all about so that they can find restoration and reconciliation. I'm going to close with a video, and this is uh, Ronnie and Anita Smith. Ronnie Smith was an American chemistry teacher. And Ronnie Smith got to visit the country of Libya, and he fell in love with the Libyan people, so much so that he decided to move his wife and his, his son that's pictured here to Libya so that he could serve and he could teach the Libyan people that he had fallen so in love with. And on December 5th, 2013, Four unidentified masked men rolled up in a black Jeep and they assassinated Ronnie Smith in cold blood. And his wife, Anita, had an incredibly uncommon response to the murder and the assassination of her very innocent husband. Watch this. What I want people to know about him, what he wants to know about him is really, it's not about what Ronnie did. It's what Ronnie wanted to show to the Libyan people and that's, He wanted to shine the light and the love of Jesus to the Libyan people that he knew, he really did. He didn't want any attention onto himself about being a good guy or a good teacher or the fun teacher. It was just about the love and the forgiveness that we know from God. And I've heard- That's what he wants to leave behind. And I've heard you say that I mean, you wrote a letter in part to to the people who killed him saying that you love them and that you forgive them. That's an extraordinary thing. I do. I, I honestly do not have any anger towards them, and I want them to know this. I don't have, I don't want any revenge. Um, I just really want them to know that I do love them and I forgive them, 
and Ronnie would want this. Um, I pray and hope that our son Hosea will believe this, and I pray with all my heart that the attackers, that maybe this incident will call them to know the love and the forgiveness that's found in Jesus. I really do. Is that something you were able to feel right away? I mean, it's only been a, a few weeks. Sometimes, you know, people may get to that stage mm -hmm. months or years later, but to feel that so soon, I think, mm -hmm. is going to surprise a lot of people. The first day of the incident, I wasn't even thinking in regards, any emotions in regards to the attackers, but it came really soon. It came within that evening or the second day. Um, it's got to be God's spirit pouring into me, replacing that anger with his love. Um, uh, yeah, they took away my husband, and I love my husband, but it's got to be God's spirit that's pushing me to show them that this is what, but this is what God wants them to see. He wants them to see that love and forgiveness is real, even if they've done this to my husband, and I want them to see this and to know this. And you really feel that in your heart. You don't feel, you don't feel anger. You don't feel, feel hatred toward them. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry I keep bringing this up, but I, I think just it's an extraordinary thing to, yeah. to, to be able to feel that. Um, I just envision the black Jeep driving up to him and I don't know their faces. I just want them to know that God loves them and can forgive them for this. And I don't know them, but my, I just, yeah, that's how I honestly feel. It may sound crazy, but and it's, a, it's God's spirit that's putting this inside of me. It, it doesn't sound crazy. It sounds and I believe it. like you're a remarkable person to, to feel this. Do, do you, wh what will you tell your child when your child grows up about, about what, your, what your husband was doing there, about what, what, what their father was doing there? We want Hosea, our son, to know that we love him so much and Ronnie loved him so much. And what Ronnie and I would want as parents for Hosea is that God loves him more and God wants him to know, just as Ronnie and I want him to know, that there's no greater thing to live your life for than to live for Jesus. And Ronnie didn't waste his life. And so that's what Ronnie and I want Hosea to see. Wow. I love the response of Anderson Cooper. He just couldn't seem to get over the fact that she forgived her husband's killers. And he said, that's extraordinary. I would say that's uncommon, is what he was saying. And that's what Jesus calls us to be. I want to read you the letter that Anita wrote, her husband's killers. My husband and best friend Ronnie Smith loved the Libyan people. For more than a year, Ronnie served as a chemistry teacher in a school in Benghazi, and he would gladly have given more years to Libya if unknown gunmen had not cut his life short on December 5th, 2013. Ronnie and I came to Libya because we saw the suffering of the Libyan people, but we also saw your hope. And we wanted to partner with you, with you to build a better future. Libya was very different from what we had experienced before, but we were excited to learn about Libyan culture. Ronnie grew, grew to love you and your way of life, as did I. Ronnie really was Libya's best friend. Friends and family from home were concerned about our safety, as were some of you. We talked about this more times than I can count. But we stayed because we believed the Libyan people were worth the risk. Even knowing what I know, I have no doubt that we would both make the same decision all over again. Ronnie loved you all so much, especially his students. He loved to joke with you, tell stories about you, help you with your lives, and challenge you to be all that you could be. He did his best to live out his faith humbly and respectfully within a community of people with a different faith. To his attackers, I love you and I forgive you. How could I not? For Jesus taught us to love our enemies, not to kill them or seek revenge. Jesus sacrificed his life out of love for the very people who killed him, as well as for us today. His death and resurrection opened the door for us to walk on the straight path to God in peace and forgiveness. Because of what Jesus did, Ronnie is with Jesus in paradise now. Jesus did not come only to take us to paradise when we die, but also to bring peace and healing on this earth. Ronnie loved you because God loves you. Ronnie loved you because God loved him. Not because Ronnie was so great, but because God is so great. Unforgiveness is the opposite of the gospel. 
Our choice to forgive or not forgive has kingdom implications. And if you're here this morning and you're struggling right now with an offense from someone, and there's that voice inside of you saying, man, get them back. Remember those words to Cain. You had the chance to be accepted. You had the chance to do the right thing. But if you don't, sin is crouching at your door and its desire is contrary to you. But you can rule over it. You can show forgiveness. Pray this morning that the Holy Spirit would do a work in your heart that as you surrender to Jesus, that he would begin to get you to a place that you can show uncommon forgiveness. Pastor Mike.